I am Ryan Hunt. I work at Mozilla on SpiderMonkey, specifically on the WebAssembly team. And yeah, that's about all you need to know. Hi, I am Conrad Watt. I kind of wear two hats. As a research fellow at Peterhouse, which is a college of the University of Cambridge, I do WebAssembly research with a specific focus on programming language theory. And then I have another hat as a co-chair of the WebAssembly community group, which is the main standards body for the core WebAssembly virtual machine. Hi, uh, I'm David. I work on the JavaScript core team at Apple. Uh, lately, I've been working on the uh, WebAssembly baseline compiler in that, but I've worked with both WebAssembly and JS in the past, and I guess mostly on uh, compiler optimizations. I'm Adam Klein. I work on V8 at Google, uh, focusing on WebAssembly and, and JavaScript standards. Um, the last couple of years, been focusing mostly on WASM GC and pushing that over the MVP line. Fantastic. Uh, so um, I want to jump back to you, David. Uh, you mentioned baseline compilers. Do you mind letting us know what those are in case people aren't aware? Oh, yeah. Uh, if you're not familiar with the concept of a baseline compiler, uh, I guess just a general introduction is that whenever you're running WebAssembly in a browser, it's getting compiled in the browser uh, at runtime. And in order to make sure that starts up quickly, we usually run it through several different compilers with increasing amounts of optimization. The baseline is the first one, so it compiles really quickly, so you start up fast. Doesn't necessarily run the fastest, though, in terms of the final code. Uh, does your baseline compiler have a special name? I know of a few others that are in the ecosystem. Yeah, uh, like a lot of the JavaScript core compilers, uh, it has a fun acronym name. It is BBQ for Build Bytecode Quickly. Uh, our higher tier is OMG for optimized machine code generation. And then uh, sort of unrelated to that, we also have the web template framework. <laughs> I, uh, I feel like I need to share Mozilla's ones because so far we have two tiers. We also have a baseline tier and an optimizing tier. And the story was that our optimizing tier was called Balder, which I don't remember the origins of that. But then um, the person who wrote our baseline tier called it Rubalder. And I'm told it's a really funny joke in Norwegian, but I don't know what it is. And uh, so. How about V8? V8 also has a baseline compiler called Liftoff, uh, and then an optimizing compiler called Turbofan. But yeah, I think the compiler landscape is really vast. There's uh, a lot of innovation for WebAssembly specifically in that space. Um, are there any cool projects that you think are, are worth highlighting right now? I'm going to open it up to all of you. Um, if, there's, if there's any new things that you're trying out or experimenting with, I think we would love to hear it. I mean, the, going back to WASM GC, that's the thing that we're currently uh, heavily invested in. And, you know, there's an origin trial right now, so people are experimenting with this in the wild. Um, and we're excited to be sort of moving in lockstep with uh, SpiderMonkey on having engine implementations uh, aligned with each other. And so that's the main thing for me. That uh, WasmGC allows you to take managed languages like Kotlin or Java and compile them to Wasm while making use of the uh, garbage collector that's already in the web VMs. And so that's super exciting. Yeah, I think that's going to be huge for the WebAssembly ecosystem, letting us bring new languages that previously didn't compile to WebAssembly uh, on, online. Um, how long has WASM GC been in the works? Oh, sure, I guess I'll give this a go. So we've been talking about it for many years. I think you may have remembered if you were following the standards process that back in 2018, we were very excited about the idea this was just going to be if not around the corner, then at least coming in the next few years. And obviously there are a lot of things that went wrong in 2020, 2021 that I don't think we all need to relive. But now I feel like we're just about at a place where it really is around a corner, which is quite exciting given the promise of being able to compile new languages to WebAssembly. I think it'll be quite exciting to get away from just the C, C++ Rust angle and see what Java can do on WebAssembly, for example. And like with many things in WebAssembly, this, it's a big group effort to make this possible. You know, there's engines implementing the, the stuff and, and people working on the spec, but there's also language tool chains that have been experimenting with us and applications using those tool chains. So it's really many layers to make it possible to, you know, experiment and vet these ideas and see that we're getting the benefits that we expect. 
Yeah, and I feel like that's the reason why there's such a long lead time on a lot of proposals is because it starts out like as a twinkle in someone's eye, like this would be a great thing to do. And then it kind of gets thrown out to the community group as an idea and there's usually a lot of discussion with that. And then there's a lot of work to kind of pull together like a, a group of people who would say like, I would commit some time developing this in my WebAssembly engine and then some tool chain folks who would end up using it too and sometimes you have to break the chicken and egg problem a little bit because people in tool chains don't want to do things if the engines aren't going to do it. Engines don't want to do it if tool chains aren't going to do it. And so sometimes it takes a bit of effort to figure that out. And then there's usually a feedback loop then where tool chains start doing something and they say, oh, this was a great idea. It just doesn't work. So you have to tweak it. And um, it just takes a long time. But hopefully the end result's pretty good. <laughs> How often do you, you feel that uh, an implementation works in, in one of the runtimes, but not in the others? And how do you resolve those differences? So when you say works, do you mean like it is implemented? Or like are you talking like web incompatibilities? Like yeah, I, I would say um, it could, be, it could, could run and could work in that one runtime. Uh, maybe it's not necessarily implemented yet, but they see a path forward and somebody else says, that's going to be terrible. It's, gonna just, it's just going to destroy all of our performance gains. Well, I think so. So I'll say just on the web compatibility thing of like how many times when people implement features and like have shipped them, usually so far, um, just the nature of things, I think we've been pretty well interoperable across engines, which has been very nice. Um, in terms of like different browsers having different opinions on standards about whether this is a good idea or not, um, I don't think that's been the largest issue. Sometimes there's usually like, I, I think there can be agreement that things are like good problems worth solving, but some of the details about how to solve them can change. And I think that's the most common thing that happens. And there is sort of like this, at least so far in the WebAssembly community group, like a nice um, implicit set of things. Like these are goals that we want core WebAssembly to have. And there's been broad agreements, so we're not fighting too many philosophical wars. It comes up sometimes, but um, there's been a good amount of agreement on things like predictable performance and avoiding the need for like really heavyweight optimization things. Um, even though it, it's never been formally agreed upon, but it, it does seem like there's good agreement on those things. Circling back a little bit to WASMGC, are there other proposals that interact with uh, the WASMGC proposal itself? Uh, I know there are many others that are in flight. Conrad? I guess I could talk both about proposals that are currently interacting with WASMGC and proposals we would expect to interact with WASMGC in the future. In terms of proposals that are interacting with WASMGC right now, I think exception handling is pretty inextricably linked with that, given that a lot of languages that have interesting exception behavior would also want to use WASMGC as part of their compilation strategy. In terms of features still to come, the one I hold close to my heart is threads. Uh, right now, the Threads proposal for WebAssembly is effectively entirely disjoint from WASMGC. And it's really only facilitating languages that are able to compile into linear memory in order to do uh, multi-threading. But the dream would be one day to make these proposals kind of talk to each other so you can have languages using the GC proposal but access the objects allocated through that proposal in a multi-threaded way. And that's certainly something that's on the roadmap for a post-minimum uh, product version of Threads as a future proposal. Uh, you, I haven't heard anything about stack switching yet. Um, I'm just gonna like stack switching. Anybody? Well, yeah. I'm, if you were gonna ask like what the next big thing that I see, I mean, multi-threading would be one, and probably stack switching would be the other. Um, this is another place where I think it's gonna be really valuable to find uh, partnerships with uh, languages and language tool chains. Um, a little bit of background: stack switching uh, is a would be addition to core. WASM that would uh, serve as a basis for a bunch of different asynchronous uh, primitives in various languages. So in Go, there's Go routines. Um, in Kotlin, you have uh, coroutines, and Dart has async await. All those things um, could be made more efficient in the format, so smaller binaries, and hopefully uh, more efficient at runtime if there is support added uh, to engines for stack switching. And so. That's something that we've been um, experimenting with like a precursor to with JavaScript promise integration in V8. 
um, and that's currently available behind a flag. We hope to be able to use that same basis, the, the, infra the infrastructure, to implement uh, core stack switching, but there's still a lot of work to be done to see what the surface area of that thing looks like. And, and then, like I said, I think it's gonna be really important to work with language implementers to see what constraints they have and what works better for, for different languages. Yeah, so uh, WASM GC is gonna let us bring more languages to both browsers and, and any other WebAssembly runtime. You stack switching, kind of the same thing, bring new different types of primitive types. WASM Threads proposal, thank you Conrad, is going to uh, let us do threading inside uh, a core WASM module, and that's, that's huge. Uh, are there any other big standards uh, or proposals that are in flight that I'm missing here? Um, I mean, there, there possibly could be. Uh, I, do, I do want to think another thing that's worth calling out too is like, whenever we think about standards at Mozilla around WebAssembly, there, I feel like there's sort of two tracks that sort of intersect at times. There's like for linear memory languages with C++ and Rust, and then there's this future GC thing, and we're super excited about the GC thing too. But there's been a lot of proposals really about like making the linear memory languages like a much more mature target over time. So there's been a lot of work done on SIMD, Relax SIMD, and um, uh, Memory64, multi-memory, and there will probably continue to be new ones as, as time comes up. And so that's also another really important area that we, we care quite a bit about. Um, tail calls was also a thing too, although that's, um, that's also sort of a, a weird intersection. Like linear memory languages can use that, but also it's like much more critical for certain GC languages as well. Um, and some of those proposals that I mentioned are like not far off from shipping. They're like phase three. A lot of implementation work's been done, but it's not quite ready to, to be uh, released yet. So hopefully we'll be able to finish that up soon. Yeah, and I think as a general trend of how we're thinking about extending WebAssembly in the future, there's still a conversation we're having about a kind of conceptual split in the way we deal with WebAssembly proposals. There are some WebAssembly proposals like GC that kind of assume the existence of a very powerful virtual machine under WebAssembly, and then you're exposing the capabilities of that virtual machine as WebAssembly instructions to help with compilation. And there's a whole other genre of uh, proposals like SIMD that are much more about tunneling down to the hardware without assuming there's some kind of intervening VM giving you a lot of capability there. And I think as we continue to think about future WebAssembly proposals, often there will be problems that can be solved with either one of the two general ways of thinking about a WebAssembly instruction set. So the example I'm thinking about now is memory mapped IO. You can either assume you have a big VM underneath that knows how to allocate buffers and talk to them, and then you're just exposing that capability to WebAssembly, and that's kind of like a web view. Or you could assume you work, you're working in a more constrained environment where you maybe don't have that, and then you'd want to solve this problem in a different way with a different feature set. And working out where to draw the line, where to put the capability, and how to express it in WebAssembly is a conversation we're still having, and I don't think we have an easy answer as to where the right thing falls in each case. Yeah, I feel like that's the tension that comes up is because like the high lofty ideal is like, what if we could do both? What if we could have something that works for both of them? And I think that's what we often shoot for, but Sometimes you do have to just say, like, no, we can't, we can't do both. We have to pick it. And so far, it hasn't been the case. But I, I do think the further we push along, we might run into that a lot more. It sounds like you need multi-tiered compilers, uh, but for standards, right? OK, I, I love it. Um, now, uh, Conrad, uh, you mentioned tail calls. Uh, I think it would be helpful if uh, you described why we would want tail calls, what do they enable, uh, and then, you know, I think uh, we can't really assume that most people know about the CG phase process. Uh, so uh, once you finish that, can you tell us a little bit more about what phase three means? Okay, so what are tail calls useful for? And then what is the CG phase process? So the high level idea of a tail call is that in a particular pattern of calling functions and moving control flow between different functions, you'd really want to reuse the space on the stack for the call frame to ensure that as a result of calling functions repeatedly, recursively, you're not overflowing the stack in a situation where conceptually you don't need to. And there are a lot of, so it's not so much a feature of languages, so this isn't the feature that's necessarily facilitating different languages being compiled to WebAssembly. It's more about a style of writing code in those languages and an assumption about the cost model for those kind of code that we're not necessarily accurately replicating in WebAssembly like right now. 
So there are a ton of source languages that assume if you syntactically call a function in a particular position, you're not going to get a stack overflow. And so long as a function at the source level is turning into a function at the WebAssembly level, uh, well, then you get into an issue if you call between WebAssembly functions and you do overflow the stack. So that's the kind of thing tail calls facilitate. It's about a different cost model of function calls and a particularly useful one given the assumptions certain source languages make about the resources that are taken up every time you do a call. I don't know if anyone else would like to give a different perspective on tail calls before I go into the CG phase process. Sounds like that's good enough. So in terms of the CG phase process, um, the key driving concept behind every stage of discussion in the CG is consensus. So the idea is we're not just having a vote and then you have a 50% plus one result and that's the thing we have to go with no matter how many people are unhappy on the other side. Really our ideal scenario is a situation where no one's objecting to a proposal going forward or if they are objecting, it's only on minor grounds and not because they don't want the proposal to go forward because they think it's totally the wrong idea. So in some sense, you could think of the default position as being, well, if people don't agree, nothing moves forward. And that's kind of reflected in each stage of our phase advancement process. So we go from phase one to phase four. And phase one is essentially, does someone have an idea that we think is feasibly something in the scope of WebAssembly that could exist in WebAssembly? And there can be a lot of disagreements on the particular way this problem is going to be solved. But so long as, in general, we think there's something that can be discussed and there's some solution that could be arrived at, generally it's pretty easy to move your proposal into phase one without anyone complaining about the specifics of it. Phase two to three is where things get a little bit more involved. With phase two, we generally expect you to have a uh, pretty precise description of exactly which instructions you want to be part of your feature and exactly what their behavior is going to be. And phase two is generally where we apply the test of, do people in the committee as a whole, as a community, think this particular um, approach is the right way to solve the problem that we agreed we were generally interested in looking at at phase one? So that tends to be the, the real test of phase two. Given your specific design for how to solve the problem, do, you think, do people think this is the right approach? Even if maybe you've not actually completely implemented it yet, at the design level, do we think it's correct? Phase three is generally where we start acknowledging that there is a complete prototype available for a feature. And at this point, it can be just one en web engine or one other engine, it can be behind a flag. But so long as there's pretty much one feature, um, one implementation that people can look at as an example of how this feature should be implemented, if there's a test suite, if there's a fairly final description of exactly all the corner cases of how the feature works, that's what we consider to go with phase three. And then phase four is full implementation. So that's two web engines. It's unanimous uh, consent effectively to unflag it and have everyone just have this thing exposed on the web and in other environments. And that's really the point of no return. If you get to phase four, you're basically going to be in the language forever because we have very strict backwards compatibility requirements. And at every stage when we're talking about, well, does this proposal advance from phase one to phase two, phase two to phase three, phase three to phase four, we are announcing ahead of time, there's going to be a vote on this so that everyone who cares can turn up. And when it comes to a vote, we ask people, do you agree with this direction? Are you neutral or do you not agree? And generally we hope that only a very, very small number of people, ideally zero, are saying not agree because of groundwork we've been doing in terms of discussions beforehand. We generally don't like to call a vote on any point of the phase advancement process if we think it would be contentious. The point of the vote is not to force a decision that we're unsure whether it's going to pass or not. It's effectively to acknowledge a state within the community that everyone's comfortable with and, and put a marker saying, this is actually what we're happy about. So the ideal situation is that while we put a high bar on phase advancement each time, we're not really having the vote unless we know it's already going to pass. And generally the hard part is the conversation that happens before the vote so that we know everyone's happy with where we are and where we want the future to be. Thank you, Conrad, that was an excellent answer. Um, I am going to ask all of you a question, uh, which is what is your favorite application of, of WebAssembly? It could be a demo, an app, um, a specific use case. Uh, know that probably each of you are gonna duplicate probably one, so think of at least two. And to give you time to think of it, uh, I, I wanted to highlight um, what you had mentioned earlier, Ryan, about 
SIMD. Uh, I think that type of advancement in WebAssembly meant that we are now able to say just about everybody in this room, yes, we're all in, at WasmCon, so we're all really into WebAssembly, but also everybody on the street that's walking around probably used WebAssembly that day because it's in uh, so many different use cases for blurring our backgrounds because we're all usually, you know, now after uh, the time period that you mentioned, a lot of us are now all virtual online and we're blurring our backgrounds because uh, we're working from home and, um, you know, it's, it's Google Meet, it's Zoom, it's... Uh, it's, it's, it's everywhere. Uh, so most people don't realize that they're using WebAssembly. Um, and so th what that means is that there are so many cool applications. And so uh, I'm gonna start with you, Ryan, and then let's go down. I appreciate you giving me time to think about this. I know that you had mentioned that you were gonna ask this and I was preparing things and I put a little to do like, okay, do some research. Cause I know there's like a lot of, I always forget about things and then I didn't do it. So. But it's two things that I can think of here. Um, one of them I think is really cool is called um, Ruffle, which is a Rust program which does like flash emulation in the browser. And I think that's just, I, I, I think that's a cool, many different layers of things. I love Rust as a programming language. I love that it compiles to WebAssembly, runs in the browser. And I love that it solves a problem of like flash emulation. And I like, I just, I love the idea of emulation too. So I think that's a really cool one. Um, another one too, and this is like one of the first use cases of WebAssembly is just running like Unity programs in the browser and like seeing like 3D graphics and things like that. You know, like I don't, I don't usually play games in the browser or anything like that. I just think it's incredible that we can do that. So those are two, two broad things. Well, I'll just give one just to minimize the chances that I'm gazumping someone else's one. Um, one of the things I found a really nice and appropriate use for WebAssembly, even in its early days, was um, image processing and manipulation in a website. And one of the reasons I thought this was nice was because it's kind of turned out that a lot of the ways people use WebAssembly is you have a big end-to-end -end app that kind of paints one pane across the whole web page, and you're just in WebAssembly world and in WebAssembly rendered world for the entire time you're in the website. But another thing we had always kind of hoped WebAssembly would be used for would be if you have a, a whole website, but one particular part of that website is doing some very intensive computation, that's the part you can swap out for WebAssembly and suddenly your entire life gets better. And I think image processing is one of the places where that's turned out to be absolutely true. And I think we've seen a lot of websites where you now have all of these, um, you know, upload an image and it gets compressed in the browser using WebAssembly or re-encoded using WebAssembly. And that's exactly the kind of thing I hoped WebAssembly was going to be used for when I saw the story of, of how it was going to make intensive computation on the web possible. So that's my example. Yeah, well, I had two examples that I thought of, and the first one was Ruffle, and the second was Unity. So, uh, <laughs> um, and I couldn't think of anything that I liked quite as much. So I might just go into, I think, a little bit of why I think it's so cool, which is that, like, uh, WebAssembly essentially functions as this, like, basically, like, coprocessor, almost like a GPU or something for the web. Like, you know, something like an emulator you might be able to cobble together with JavaScript, certainly people have, but WebAssembly just makes it that much easier. And, you know, in, in terms of just sheer performance, especially once, you know, you have these instructions like SIMD that go pretty much directly from WASM to uh, hardware instructions, like one-to-one -one in a lot of cases, uh, then it, it really opens up this massive use case of, yeah, like you can run Unity and, you know, Unreal and other engines in the browser. And I really think it shouldn't be understated how, like, absurd that is. Like, that's wild that that's possible. Uh, and it's all just because there's this, like, really nice close to the hardware mapping now. And that's where I think, like, WebAssembly, like, really impresses me. Okay, so I should, I have the most time, I should have the, the most elaborate answers here. Um, I have actually more than two I'm trying to figure out what to talk about, but I'll, I'll start with, you know, one that uh, was a big deal for, for me over the last five years, which was Photoshop. Um, and, you know, there's a couple of things I wanted to say about that. One, one piece is just that it was, you know, it is one of these things like getting 3D games or something running, where just having it is this major shift for people to say, oh, this is actually a thing that can be on the web. But one of my favorite things about the story of getting Photoshop onto the web was sort of in the development process, seeing how it, they didn't just say, okay, we'll take Photoshop and make it and just like compile the whole thing with the UI to the web. You know, there was a whole web team that, that worked to, you know, do a web components based UI. Um, they thought a lot about like how being on the web would change the workflow, how it could be, you know, link based and, um, and, and how things that, you know, we got to this point actually where I, I 
where it was loading faster than the native app did, and yet it still seemed really slow. And so you know, the, the, we spent a lot of time on loading because the expectations for the web are different. And it was fun to see a team and a company that was, had this really old product that was used to working on that in a, one context try to bring it into another context and you know, work, have to work to fit it in, and then doing that, go, going through that process with them. And, and as someone who is, you know, works with WebAssembly as part of the web, web is the like key thing for me, and so that was that was fun to see. Um, the, the other thing I would say is the the thing that excites me about WebAssembly. Yeah, there are examples now, but I think building on some of the kind of the same things that folks just said, the thing that the reason I'm still excited going forward is because. I think this is a way to to enable the web to grow stuff that we haven't thought of. So image processing is is one. You know, we're seeing a lot of stuff like blurred backgrounds using uh, client side ML, and we're not. I don't know what the next one is actually going to be that's really going to be good for users, but there will be something, and I'm happy that that thing is happening in an open standard that works across browsers. So we don't have to uh, do this via a proprietary thing. You know, I think of like the video tag in, in HTML as the kind of thing that I want to enable, whatever that next thing is, whether it's the metaverse or I don't know. But like, I think WebAssembly is going to be a key part of making it possible to do stuff we haven't figured out how to do on the web and do it in a way that works across browsers. Yeah, I love that answer. I think there are so many different things that we haven't seen yet. But I think over the next year, we definitely will. Uh, WebAssembly hit MVP, I want to say, in 2017. I want to see some nods. Okay, all right, we got that date right. Uh, and then in 2019, that was when it became the official language of the web. Uh, you guys hate that, huh? Fourth, fourth language of the web. I said that wrong. I get the, I get the Snickers now. I'm sorry. Uh, um, what if I said that on purpose? Uh, I didn't, though. Um, be Believe honest. it. It is the official language. <laughs> it is the official language of the web. Thank you. Um, Okay, so I think now we should probably open it up to get a few questions from the audience, if you're okay with that. Um, hey, I see one hand back here. Apache TVM that uses... Uh, it So, so I don't know a lot. I don't know anything about Apache TVM in particular. Um, there's a ton of, I mean, the, you know, ML space is moving very fast right now. Um, I know there's a lot of questions about, yeah, how, what the right way to layer this stuff is, how many layers we want to build, whether those layers are going to be in the browser. Um, I think I don't, I don't really, I, I do hope, I do think that WebAssembly right now is a really important piece of this. And I think it goes into the, being able to bootstrap this and experiment and do that stuff in user space before we have to make decisions about, you know, working with other folks in the W3C about whether there are things we do want to build into browsers that, that are, you know, higher level. Um, that sort of builds on extensible web manifesto stuff from, from years ago. Um, but that's my thought for now. And, and, we're gonna, and we're continuing to add stuff. So SIMD and RelaxSIMD both were heavily um, influenced by by machine learning use cases, and I expect more of that uh, getting access to fast things in the CPU. And one, one other piece is that we're, there's also a, a speaking of sidecars, WebGPU is a piece that's being used a lot in this space. And so in, in Chrome and V8, we're thinking about how we can better interact with WebGPU either through you know, lower overhead calls, ways of, of sharing the memory space so we don't have to do copies. Um, that's the way, I mean, at least from the V8 perspective, that's how we're thinking about ML. I think from the Chrome perspective, in the broader web platform, there are interesting questions about can we add something higher level. Do we have other questions? Hey, yes. All right, so this is kind of relevant to the other kind of use case. Uh, one of the big things that modern GPUs really unlock is the ability to single interface between the component and the actual uh, model that you're modeling and that actual GPU. So this is kind of controversial to talk about this because it pops up in Java and Java all the time. So it's open question. What are your what are your thoughts on this? So this is like a area that has had a lot of history in terms of like proposals and um, I'm not probably the best person to like go over all the different iterations of it. Um, what I can just say is like from Mozilla's perspective, there's the very first thing is like today if you have WebAssembly, 
and you want to call a DOM API, you can already do that with a lot of tool chains. Like if you're on Rust, you can use Wasm bind gen. I think with mscripten, you can use an mscripten thing. And so it's already possible to do a lot of this stuff. And we've also done a lot of performance optimization to make when you cross between JavaScript and WebAssembly as fast as possible. And so there's a couple angles that when I hear this question, I wonder, is it, is it ergonomics? Like, is it that the tools are painful to use? Is it performance that these tools don't like, uh, the, co the code that they have isn't fast enough? Or because it's not, to my knowledge, something about expressivity, because I think you can use any API today from WebAssembly. So um, when it comes to ergonomics, I have not heard anything that makes it sound like this is something that's really pressing. Um, and then when it comes to performance, I would love to hear more data on that. So that's been sort of my stance on it. And I think we could totally add new features to like WebAssembly to make it easier to call DOM things, but they need to be motivated by like especially performance because it already seems like it's something that's feasible today. So in particular, my understanding of this is that one of the key bottlenecks for DOM interaction WebAssembly is string manipulation, which is a topic that I think everyone here is aware we've been talking about quite extensively in WebAssembly, ways to make string manipulation, especially in interfacing with JavaScript faster. So it's an active area of discussion, especially over the last couple of months. And GC is the first step towards this, and we know more will come in future. Yeah, it's a little bit, of, I mean, it could also be like a chicken and egg thing. like if. I don't know if there's people out there who don't even try and do this because it's just so terrible that they don't even try. Or I also don't know if it's just actually, it's just fine. And so this is an area where like, um, I always appreciate community engagement and um, there's, it's kind of hard because the avenues for it that I know of is right now is you can file like a bug for Mozilla, you can file an issue for Chromium or WebKit, or you can like show up to like the WebAssembly standards process, which is almost, it's sort of like a, alien culture if you've never been around it before. But um, yeah, I appreciate anyone reaching out with like, you know, real concrete things of like, I want to do this and it's really slow because of something like WebAssembly specifically does. And so that'd be really helpful. Yeah, so feedback uh, and joining the community group is, is a great way to get involved. Um, but all of these projects are also all open source or open standards. Uh, and I think that's really important to highlight um, David, do you mind mentioning where the people could get started uh, with what you work on? As in, like, uh, if they wanted to communicate with WebKit in some way? What if they wanted to contribute? Yeah. Um, oh gosh, I probably should have looked at the full like documentation for this. Uh, there is, <laughs> if you go, so WebKit is uh, fully on GitHub. You can see all the WebKit source, including JavaScript Core, which, as part of that, contains our WebAssembly uh, engine. Uh, as part of that, we have uh, some documentation on how to contribute. Um, you can also reach out in terms of, uh, there's an open source Slack that I believe is linked from there. Uh, we all, you know, on my team and you know, other, pe other people on WebKit, uh, I'll check that pretty often. Um, so I think if you want to reach out, probably that Slack is a good place. If you want to contribute, um, I mean, we have, uh, like, we have a public Bugzilla, you can look through there. Uh, you can ask on the Slack if there's anything in particular you want to contribute to. Um, and uh, there, is, there is a bit of a process that I don't remember all, like 100% of the details for, for uh, you know, getting a little bit more status in terms of like being able to commit more freely. But uh, yeah, you definitely can. So uh, if, if any of you are interested in contributing towards you know, WebAssembly features in WebKit, uh, it's definitely open. Do we have any other questions from the audience? If not, I think we just finished exactly on time. So good work, everyone. Thank you.